Ready to go? Okay. Good evening from Australia and most of Southeast Asia. It is very good morning, uh, early morning in Minnesota, United States. Uh, for John, our speakers, and also late morning uh, from Angus in London in the United Kingdom. Good afternoon to most of Asia, Middle East and Indian subcontinent, and uh, late afternoon in uh, Japan and Korea. My name is Ted Ma, and I'm the inaugural president of the APOA, Hen Up Lim Society. Uh, this society was founded in the difficult time of COVID in May 2020, with foundation members from 15 countries across Asia Pacific region. I welcome everyone who could join us for this webinar on masterclass in reverse shoulder arthroplasty. The APOA Hen Up Lim Society provides regular free education webinars to educate trainees and non trainee registrar as well as consultants, surgeons who are interested in Hen Up Lim surgery. Tonight, however, is a special webinar covering some important issues related to reverse shoulder replacement for the senior and perhaps less senior surgeons. I thank uh, Stryker for sponsoring our webinars. I'm sure we all learned something new tonight from the invited speakers who are experts in reverse shoulder replacements. Apart from the biomechanics, you may be interested to hear the discussion, especially on biological supplementation versus mental augmentations to deal with abnormal glenoid morphology. I'd like to introduce uh, and invite Professor Ingho Jung, who is the president-elect of uh, APOA Hen Up Lim, to introduce Professor Engel Wallace, who would co-chair as moderator to start the session. Ingho, over to you. Okay, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your joining APOA Hand and Up Limb uh, Society uh, webinar. And I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Angus Wallace from Nottingham, United Kingdom as our uh, moderator. Angus, would you please uh, give any comments or hello to our uh, members? I'm delighted to be here for your conference. Uh, I just have a couple of slides, if I may uh, share my screen with you. Uh, and I think, uh, well, I can't share because somebody else is sharing. So uh, is it possible for me to share my screen? Yes, sir, you can share now. That's lovely. I just wanted to clarify what a moderator is. Um, I am a moderator with Inho John, who is a very good colleague. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, a moderator is a person whose job is to help people or groups who disagree to reach an agreement. Angus, uh, However, we need your slides. Sorry about Have you that. not got my slides? No. Oh, right. I thought I was sharing them. Uh, hold on. Uh, let me just go to... Right. Let me come back. I did try to share my screen. Ah, there we are. Share my screen. Thank you, Inho. Okay, now it works. <laughs> so what is a moder, your screen sharing? Uh, yeah. So Inho and I are moderators and the role of a moderator is to be a person whose job is to help people or groups who disagree to reach an agreement. So that's our role. If I was, uh, speaking to you with my Scottish hat on, the moderator of the Church of Scotland is responsible for keeping the senior members of the Church of Scotland <laughs> and is in charge of them. So Inho and I will try to be in charge of the 
uh, speakers and the audience at this conference. I'm delighted to be here and I will hand back my uh, screen now to Inho. Okay, thanks very much for your comment, Angus. Uh, you always give us pleasure. Okay, uh, before, uh, to avoid any delay, I would like to uh, introduce our uh, first speaker. We have four renowned speakers from all over the world. So Professor Ju Han Oh, as our first speaker, he was the, he was the uh, past president of Korean Shoulder and Elbow Society, and he is an excellent clinician and scientist, publishing numerous papers in the major journals. So uh, I would like to ask Professor Oh Ju Han essential biomechanical concept in reverse shoulder arthroplasty so that we can start reverse shoulder. Okay, over to you, Professor Oh Ju Han. Thank you, you know. Uh, thank you, Ino, and thank you, Professor Wallace. I really, really love your tie with the Korean letters. So, I really congratulate on your APOA Hand and Upper, Upper Limb Society webinar. I'm really happy to be invited as first speaker in terms of the biomechanics. I like to talk about today the essential biomechanics for successful reverse. I like to start with the humeral stem. As you know that the traditional concept of humeral neck shaft angle is usually at the beginning it was 155 due to stability of the construct. But according to several studies, including my papers as well, that the current trend is lowering the neck shaft angle and we will talk about in offset session later. And also the traditional concept of the human retroversion in re reverse is usually zero or versus 20 or 30 degrees of retroversion, usually according to experts' opinion, but several biomechanical or the clinical study, including just published uh, last year that uh, the individualized retroversion, according to the patient is better the superior clinical outcomes than fixed 20 degrees of retroversion. So I usually do the CT scan with including elbow and I measure the individual, the patient's best figure retroversion setting. My major talk of tonight is the offset of the implants. Sometimes we need enter, enter offset to give more the terrace minor tangening or sometimes posterior offset in patient of the anterior bony deficiency and so on. But probably many of, many of you have the, usually use the inferior offset to give more the uh, acromiohumeral distance, more deltoid lengthening, or to, to prevent the scapula notching. According to my uh, two centers study with my friend JC, you that some kind of this Infilization, and that is the inferior notching, inferior offsets is very important for prevent notching. It's probably the most important thing to prevent notching. So I routinely use this kind of eccentric lenospheres to prevent uh, scapular notching. But as you can guess that this kind of the uh, inferior offsets produce some kind of pain, even several millimeters or cause the acromial fractures. Main, main problem of main issues recently is medial or uh, lateral offsets. As you know, as you know that cuff is usually humeral head goes superiorly or laterally. But first reverse, as you know that, give only desalization that cause the loosening of the glenoid components. So they made a little bit more medialized to give more deltoid fibers to, to, to recruit. And this probably is the basic concept of the reverse arthroplasty. But as you know, there are several problems of this kind of medial offsets. Number one, the loss of shoulder control, even they are really old lady, but they're really concerned about this kind of the loss of shoulder control. 
And also this kind of the deltoid pool, distraction moment to pool of the deltoid cause some kind of the instability or cause more adduction scapular notching or reduce the remaining cough cause loss of what weakness of the active exonotation. Another thing we have to consider is the racial difference of the anatomy between the Asian versus Caucasians and so on. I have the direct comparison of, with Mark Frankel that is the anatomy of the Korean and Caucasians in the United States that as you can guess, the Koreans are small, but neck shaft angle was also similar to each other, but human retroversion is greater in Asian and critical shoulder angle, that is acromial length is longer in Korean. So we have to think of the lateral offset reverse always for the small patients as well as Asian people. So how to solve this medialized uh, center of rotations is two way glenosphere or humerus. Let's talk about the glenoid first. How to make the lateral glenosphere? Number one, thickness of glenosphere should be increased. Like this kind of the two thirds of the sphere that cause increase of the range of motion and reduce of the notching. But this kind of prophetic lateralization cause the sharing force of the glenoid fixation, as you can, as you know, that it can cause the increase the failure rate. So when we can use this kind of the prophetic lateralization, we just look at the scapular AP x-rays and if measure the scapular neck length is more than nine millimeters, it's, it's a little uh, worry about the notching. If it is less than nine millimeters, I like to use the, this kind of pro prophetic lateralization. Second way of the glenoid, glenoid lateralization is bone graft. As you know, the one, one centimeter of bone graft cause make it a uh, long scapular neck. So I like to use this kind of bone graft impatient of uh, bone deficient in, this, in, the scap, in the glenoid. This kind of one to 1.3 millimeters of the bone graft can be put on the native glenoid and we can put more the lateralization of center of rotations. The last way of the lateral glenosphere is thickness, a uh, diameters of glenosphere, but it's this kind of the bigger glenosphere, 42, 46, probably this several biomechanical studies says that better range of motion and lesser chance of scapular notching with a better, uh, larger glenosphere size. So we can use this bigger glenosphere if the patient is big enough. This kind of glenoid lateralization, we can improve uh, the contour of shoulder and give, we can get more stability. And also the, we can decrease the scapular notching and improve fixed notation of the patient. However, as I said before, this cause of the glenoid lateralization cause some loosening, even though there are some cadaveric study and computer simulation study that there's no difference in uh, one centimeters of glenoid lateralization in terms of the sharing force. And I'm, it is lucky that shoulder is not that weight, uh, the weight bearing joint. Another the, the disadvantage of the uh, glenoid lateralization is deltoids, decrease of del deltoid movement arm. Probably this cannot, this kind of the complication, disadvantage cannot overcome this paralysis or cause sometimes acumen fractures or severe pain. And the next way is to humor offset. There are this kind of lateral humor offset, probably we can restore the reverse, I mean, cough tangening or increase delta wrapping by several ways. Number one, various implant. In, instead of the 155, we can put on the 135. This cause more lateral displacement of central rotation. So several papers says that various neck shaft angle reduce the notching and increase range of motions. So, but we don't know which, uh, which neck shaft angle is better, the best. But as we, we said before that, current trend is lowering the neck shaft angle. Humorous stem positioning is also the way of lateral offsets. As you see here, right side on lane is much more neck, neck cutting or around 150, 55, 135 is more anatomical inclination with the various implant uh, insertion. 
And we don't have to dig into the metaphysics with this kind of online positioning. So we can preserve the tuberosity or the metaphysical bone stock. And also cause better range of motion compared to other the innate system. Also, we can, if we can put the more thickness, thicker socket or thicker humeral tray cause better range of motion. So by this humeral alternation, we also improve shoulder control stability and improve the scapular notching or active excitations as well as glenoid fixation. But same complications, decrease the deltoid movement arm, and also sometimes overload deltoid cause acromial fracture. But this kind of the humoral association also have various, not common, but a little bit serious complication with abduction notching because close the lateral offset cause decreased acromial and humoral distance cause abduction notching. My patient x-ray is post-operative, three months, six months, and one year. You can see here the abduction notching, uh, acromion notching. So after three years after reverse, the humeral tray has the broken. So this kind of complication, we have to predict. So I reviewed my patients, more than 100 of the lateral offset implant that I measure several kinds of the measurement with pre and post-operative x-ray said that according to my data that abduction notching was related to less distalization and more lateralization in lateral implant. So that is, if the patient has smaller preoperative acromial GT angle is smaller than 35 or humor lateralization is more than 1.5 centimeters probably high risk of the abduction notch. So in those kind of patients, we'd better use this kind of offset humeral tray to reduce the lateralization. So this kind of uh, eccentric humeral offset probably cause a little bit more distalization and a little bit more medialization with lateral center of rotation. So my conclusion with the Better outcome with the, uh, in terms of the biomechanical characteristics, medial or lateral. We can be selected according to patient individual needs. In patient paralysis or really fixed humor head elevation, probably medialization is useful. But lateralization, we have to think when the patient has high risk of notching, such as scapular neck length is smaller than nine millimeters or subscape failure as well. And also loss of really weak active external rotation. We better think of lateralizations. Which way, glenoid or humerus? So at first we better think about glenoid, scapular neck length, patient size or bone defect of glenoid. And then we can choose the humor component according to the a glenoid option, we can determine the humor options accordingly. So ultimately it is important to mix two concepts well to get the best result. So I will show my decision making process of the how to decide of my the offset. My routine is inferior offset around three millimeters. And then if the patient has pseudopolysis, or leg shaft angle is under 30 degrees, I like to use medial center of rotation. Otherwise, I like to use the lateral offset. If the patient is neck shaft angle is under nine millimeters, really big patient or bone defect more than 15 degrees or central defect, I like to use the glenoid lateralization. Otherwise, I like to use humoral lateralization. But in case of critical shoulder angle is smaller than 32 and acromial shoulder, acromial GT angle is under 35 degrees and humoral lateralization is more than 1.5, I like to use essential humoral tray with humoral lateralization. That is my uh, decision making with the patient specific decision. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Oju Han. It was an excellent lecture. Uh, Thank you. We have a Dr. Ashe Kekapre.
as for designated commentator for uh, this topic. Uh, I think some of our talk is overlapping with the implant design with the John Spalding later on, but uh, Dr. Ashe, now over to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Professor John. Uh, thank you, Professor O. It was a very lucid presentation. You have uh, very nicely uh, explained regarding the evolution of uh, the reverse uh, biomechanics. Also, uh, what are the design considerations that have evolved with the problems which are arising? So the talk has pretty much concluded or rather combined all the recent concepts as well as the problems we are dealing with. Uh, so from your talk, it is more of that the, uh, the offset, I mean, glenoid offset should be individualized to the patient as well as medialization as well as lateralization should be uh, as per the patient's need. The biomechanical aspect, if you consider there are certain questions we would like to ask which aspect, if you do a certain approach, uh, right, the deltoid approach, which aspect of the deltoid do you consider more important in your decision making process while doing your surgery? Yeah, that is really, really important questions. According to my last PowerPoint, that we have to think about what is most the patient wants. So if the patient is good deltoid, and patient is pseudoparalytic for several months, I think the shoulder elevation is most important part of this surgery. So in those cases, even the patient has the, the we would better to get the shoulder elevation. So desalization with some medialization is important. If the patient has no active ER in those patients, we can, use the LD transfer with the reverse and so on. So in those cases, we have to focus on desalization and medialization. But some patients, some pseudopyloid patient has the good elevations with really severe pain and so on. So in those cases, we better think more on lateral offset. In those cases, we can put on lateral implant, kind of the humoral lateralization Glenoid is okay. We can use just humerus with lateralization. That is enough. But in case of some patient has the high risk of the, uh, I mean, the neck shafting is really short, short scapular neck. We'd better put more on bigger, I mean, the thick glenosphere cost. So we can put, we can choose uh, according to the patient's the anatomy and patient's symptoms and so on. Uh, another question yeah. is that, you have, you have a question coming, if I may. Uh, can I interrupt you for a minute? Yes, sir. Um, one question, which is more relevant, clinically anterior or posterior offset in terms of arthroplasty? Now, I have already a part left. All humeral heads are posteriorly offset with mm -hmm. a variation of about 5 degrees to 35 degrees retroversion. Correct. Um, in my own practice, I tend to put reverse shoulders in 20 degrees retroversion. What do you do? Yes. I mean, the anterior and posterior offset is, we, we don't have to think about much in routine reverse, I think. that. But after head cuts, you, we usually make the point of the owling, that is the, for the humerus stem. If it is a little bit eccentric, I, I'm consider, considered sometimes anterior and posterior offset. And after the 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 trier trier the humor of uh, humor stem, if it is too anterior anteriorly placed, sometimes we need a little bit posterior offset to give more the bone stock on anterior side and so on. That's not routine, but sometimes it is necessary, I think. Uh, that's that's, can... that's per perfect, actually. But what you are doing is to use the bone that is available and mm -hmm. use it in the most practical and sensible way. And you can see that once your head has been removed. Now, I'm going to hand back to Ashley. 
I apologise for inter interrupting, Ashley, but our job is to pick up the questions and deal with them. Uh -huh. Over to you. Yeah. Professor, I mean, it is, I mean, yes. Thanks a lot. Oh, I was coming to that. I mean, to add Professor Angus Wallace's question, I would like to ask you, uh, you have mentioned regarding to prevent scapular notching. You have a particular measurement, like you add 1 to 1.5 centimeters of bone graft. So is the thickness of this graft also individualized? How do you plan for it? Usually that for the bone graft bio, okay. usually one centimeters of thickness is correlated with 1.5, 1 1.2 centimeters usually. So eccentric bone wear of the glenoid side anteriorly or posteriorly, I don't put more, I don't like to eccentric, eccentric rimming because it caused some part of the medialization. So I don't want, I don't like the media, the eccentric rimming instead of it. I like to use the bone graft. So my, my rule of thumb is the 15 degree is usually around one centimeter. So I put on there with a bone graft and fix it with the peripheral screws and so on. That's it. I mean, is there any other questions, Professor? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, Ashay, uh, let me interrupt you again. We have one question from the audience. I think this directs to uh, Professor Johan or the study. Yeah. You understand that we have a lot of radiographic uh, measurement and indexes, indices. Mm -hmm. So uh, all different combination of humeral stem and glenosphere, does it really affect range of motion? Because all numerous factors are all interconnected. So his question is like this. I understand the neck cut is at 135 degrees, but the angle of the edge of the linear liner creates a higher angle, and in some cases, 255 degrees. Is this taken into consideration in the studies you quote? Yes, really, that's really clever questions. Yes, <laughs> most, yeah, most of the implant has the Usually, even though they have 135 neck cuts, they have the tray angle. That's usually the neck shaft and rear neck shaft angle is around 142 to 147. So around 145 is most common, I think. Yes, I'm considering that uh, the the angle in my in my test. So recently, most of the implant in the market, they are plus or minus around 145, I think. So uh, we have one more uh, question from uh, the audience. It was quoted that subscap dysfunction leads to failure. Weaker rotate cuff is itself a contraindication to reverse shoulder. So how would you like to answer this question? I don't think so. Even the patient is for the subscape failure to repair, I like to use reverse arthroplasty, but in case of we cannot repair the subscap after the implantation, a little bit higher risk of the subluxation. So I like to use a little bit lateral implant instead of the medial one. And also the, also the lateral implant cause give more tangening of the uh, subscap or the remaining infra teres minor that cause more stabilization. So I like to use the lateral implant in those kind of weak rotated cuff patients. Excellent. Angus? Yeah. Angus? This one question. Okay. Johan, I recognize that the bio implant, mm -hmm. somebody's got a lot of sound, uh, the bio implant um, has been developed by Pascal Boileau in order to lateralize the glenoid. Do you know or have you worked out whether there is a difference in the need for that comparing one prosthesis with another? In other words, does the design of prosthesis dictate 
whether you need to use a biological offset. So you mean the indication of bio, you said? Yeah. Yeah, that's, I'm not sure that Pasca still use routinely for the bio for all implants, but yeah. probably sometimes it's useful in short scapula neck. That is the, the scapula neck length is under nine millimeters, a little bit higher risk of notching. We can put on bone graft over there to make long, to long the, the scapula neck. Or as I said before, the some kind of the glenoid wear, posterior wear or the superior wear. You can, I like to use bone graft because we don't, in Korea, we have little company to use the augment space plate. Probably John will talk about that. That's if you can use the augment the base plate, you can use it, but I prefer to use in practical the situation in Korea, I like to use the bone graft for those kind of the bone deficients, even in five degrees or 10 degrees. I don't like essential rimming, but put the bio on that. Of course, some of the reason for using a biological implant is that the modified glenoid base plates are more expensive. And as a Scotsman, Mm -hmm. With my Scottish hat on, the money is very important. The financial yeah. cost of the operation. Yeah, yeah, right. Over to yeah. you, Enho. Okay, Ashe, you have some questions. Yeah, uh, there are lots of questions in the question box. Uh, mm -hmm. One question is for then, sir, uh, Professor O. Yeah. Uh, the audience would like you uh, to answer regarding the role of inclination and uh, how it influences the biomechanics of reverse. Inclination of the glenosphere. Uh, I mean that, in, uh, I mean, ah, in, in theory, uh, in theory, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of debates of the inferior inclination 10 to 15 degrees. I don't agree, we have to, we have to do 10 to 15 degrees of inferior tilting, but we have to consider the inferior tilting. Otherwise, the surgeons forget about the superior tilting of glenosphere. Usually, normal anatomy of glenoid is three to five degrees of superior tilting. Otherwise, we give intentionally a little bit 10 degrees inferior tilt. Probably it causes superior tilting of glenosphere. So, I know that John usually routinely use five to 10 degrees of glenoid augment to uh, prevent those kind of uh, complications. So 10 degree is not that important, but you have to think about normal anatomy of glenoid that is three to five degrees of superior tilt. Superior tilting, that is the dangerous. Okay. Uh... Thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, excuse uh, those participants who uh, uploaded lots of questions. I'm intentionally preserving some of these questions for the third session because it can be very interesting we, if we can have a debate in the, at the last minute. So uh, those of you who ask the questions, please bear us a few more minutes. So, I will write down okay. on that, okay? I will Sorry. write down on that. At, 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 after my talk, okay? We'll appreciate it. Thank okay. you. Angus, Thank over you. to you. Thank you very much. Uh, Johan, that was a fantastic presentation and thank you for keeping it at a level that people can understand. Uh, that was really appreciated. And okay. it's my responsibility, my honor now to introduce Ashish Bubakar who is head of the Department of Shoulder and Sports Medicine at Dinanath uh, Mankenshkar Hospital, Pune, India. Uh, Ash, did I get that right? You're almost there. <laughs> almost there. He's founder president of the Shoulder and Elbow Society in India. And not only is he famous in India as a shoulder surgeon, he's also famous in the UK and is known 
uh, very well in the UK and is a good friend of our British Elbow and Shoulder Society. So I'm delighted that Ash has agreed to talk to us uh, and present to us on reverse shoulders. Ash, over to you. Thank you, Angus, for that very kind introduction. And it's always good to share thoughts with uh, people from Queens, uh, Nottingham, and uh, we are inspired on the shoulder program uh, with your rehab and work at Nottingham. Uh, thank you very much um, for this invitation. And Tedma and Ino, uh, it's a real privilege that you put this uh, superb uh, webinar together. So without delay, there's so much to cover in this uh, talk and my remit is to speak on exposure and techniques and complicated cases. I'll move on. So divide the talk between the trips and tricks on approaches and a little bit on techniques uh, and then finally finish off on how we go about complex cases as such. So I think it's a given that all of us would resort to a beach chair position. It has a lazy beach chair, deck chair position. Uh, it's important to stabilize the cervical spine. I spend a lot of time doing that. And there's a lateral tilt added. I'll talk about that later when you come to the glenoid exposure. It's very important that the arm must be completely free so that you can bring it back in extension uh, when you want to ream the humerus. And so the table should not be a constraint to exposing the proximal humerus. And I almost always use the Mayo table as my first trusted assistant. Now I've always carried the torch for the deltoid split approach because I was trained by the French and they would do all their cases even today by the deltoid split. There's a time I was under the impression that uh, McKenzie approach or the deltoid split approach was the complete answer to global warming. And then uh, slowly I understood, and as you got experience, that uh, there are other approaches as well. So now I'm fairly equipoised between deltoid split and the uh, deltopectoral approach, but you must know which to do when. <clears throat> Most of us are sold out on one approach, but I would mix and match on these. So certainly when I have a simple cuff tear arthropathy without steep proximal migration, I would head to deltoid split. It's still my favorite approach, is much quicker, shorter, and uh, very elegant with a smaller scar. And especially if my subscaps are intact, then I would rather not touch it by doing the deltoid split. But it's not extensile. I cannot use it for complex revision cases. And certainly if it's a trauma case, four-part fracture, I'm going to rely on the deltoid, uh, deltopectoral approach. When one finishes the deltoid split, it's very important to do a proper, diligent, transosseous deltoid, anterior deltoid repair through the acrumen with a non-absorbable number two suture. Certainly don't use it for cases like this where there's a steep proximal migration because you would compromise the ex exposure and then result in a difficult case. <clears throat> the delta pack is of course the go-to approach. Most of us are familiar. And if you're familiar with this, then go ahead and do your delta pectoral approach. My only thing is that my incision is fairly lateral so that I'm heading into the glenoid and plus it takes my scar away from the axilla, which is what we want to do. It is not only modular, you can ex it's an extensile approach. So when you're in trouble, you can extend it proximally, distally, easily. It's supposed to preserve the deltoid, but it's not so. Your retractor on the lateral side is very critical. If you see some of your uh, proximal humerus fracture cases or the deltopectoral cases, six months down the line, they're sloughing off of the anterior deltoid. And that's probably because the anterior branch of the axial nerve has been damaged because of that anterior bone lever. So you must be very careful where you put your homan in. Uh, it's not necessary that the delta is always protected. I would use this for all my revisions. And if you're planning a lat dorsi transfer at the same time, then I'm compelled to use the delta pectoral approach. So there are a number of implants available and uh, so to each his own. Those of us who are loyal to one single implant, then they know which approach to use and they can stick to that. But those of us like me who flirt between different prostheses, then you must understand a caveat that not all prostheses have a different resection guide for deltopectoral and deltoid split. So 
it's important that if you're using deltoid split and deltopectoral, there are separate resection guides for individual processes. Not all processes are designed to be inserted through the deltoid split. <clears throat> Coming to instruments, uh, I'm sure most of us share the same instruments, but I would find it very difficult to do a reverse without a pair of GLP. A blunt homan, not the standard sharp homan. I need a blunt homan and I'll show you why. And of course the wire retractor, or you can call it the playboy retractor, is critical to expose the glenoid acid. <clears throat> when I come to the glenoid exposure, I would roll the table 10 degrees away from the surgeon towards the anesthetist to bring that glenoid into view. <clears throat> and when you do an adequate humeral cut, then your exposure of the glenoid is absolutely capacious and you will have a very good view without compromising reaming and exposure. But be careful when you're doing a very conservative humeral cut is going to come in the way. The wire retractor has to be put in very safely in a, uh, under observation so that you're not damaging the axillary nerve and putting it right under the six o'clock position of the glenoid. Do I resect the triceps always? I don't unless I'm finding a very tight, difficult revision case and I'm not uh, balancing the soft tissues enough, I would resect the triceps, but I wouldn't do that in all my cases. So here you see the <clears throat> deltopectoral approach, and this is the blunt homan that comes in. The reason it's blunt, it's a very broad tip, so it's not damaging the posterior tough, and I can freely tension it, and that really opens up the book and allows the proximal humerus to herniate out of the wound, so you get a fantastic exposure. So what you see in the back is a very broad blunt hormone and here you have a standard sharp hormone which goes underneath the neck of the humerus <clears throat> excuse me so on the humeral side um, the subscap can be taken down in a number of different techniques and uh, you can use whatever floats your board because uh, this is an elegant paper from uh, george atwal's team uh, 2012 i think where they did a randomized study between a lesser tuberosity osteotomy, a tenotomy, and a sleeve. And there was very little to choose between the three. They had all similar results. On my principles, uh, for my total shoulder replacements, anatomicals, I would always do a lesser tuberosity osteotomy. And for my reverses, I do a flake or a sleeve um, subscap resection. And uh, I think the humeral side release releases are underutilized always. So when you're doing that inferior capsule release, Rather than risking the axial nerve under the glenoid, I would spend some time doing the release on the six o'clock of the humerus position. You can do it extensively without any restrictions. Your humeral resection cut is going to dictate the glenoid exposure. So be firmly sure, and I base that on my pre-op planning. So it's not a fixed cut for every patient. I have no shame in saying that I use the CM imaging very frequently during my surgeries, and it's a very straightforward, simple case. And this is a four-part fracture case. And if you look at the top diagram here, you can see the lesser tuberosity and greater tuberosity are floating up here, even on the axials. And then when I pass my sutures and do an elegant repair, I know that they're sitting there anatomically. So I need that confirmation so that two months down the line, your X-ray looks like this, where that greater tuberosity is back in position as if it belongs there. The lesser is also wedded to its anatomical base. It's important to notify this on the actual X-ray also. There's a nice paper from San Diego where they have shown that it's not uncommon for the lesser tuberosity to float away. And there's, it's not guaranteed that it will heal back into its own bed. So cases like this one on the left, you have a proximal humerus, uh, poorly fixed fracture, subluxed, axial nerve palsy. These are difficult patients requires a lot of application, lots of releases. On the right, you have a 60-year-old lady who has had a cuff repair and lataji that's gone wrong. And then these are revision cases, a lot of scarring, the soft tissue is not clear. So you will need to do a lot of releases, but you have to be very careful of the brachial plexus. So on a deltopectoral approach here, um, on the left shoulder, I'm bringing in my wire retractor here, tuck it underneath the glenoid. And when you pull it down, it's not only exposing glenoid, it's taking the shaft of the humerus away. That's very important, which has a stem inside it. And then I come in with a sharp homan at 10 o'clock and then another homan at two o'clock. So this is my 
standard positioning of my bone levers at six o'clock, two o'clock and 10 o'clock. And this will open up the window completely. I leave that stump of long head of biceps as an anchor. It's like my lighthouse. It allows me to grab it with a Martin. And then I take down the uh, bovi so that I can take down the anterior uh, labrum through the MGHL and IGHL. And then I leave that stump there down in the axillary pouch and then move in and use the Martins to grab the remaining part of the posterior labrum and then grab it with the Martin and finish off. But I try and keep that ring together. So when I've removed the labrum, I've removed it as an entire 360 degree limb as far as possible so that I have practically done all my releases and that long enough bicep stump helps me identify where I need to start. So that kind of clearly exposes the entire glenoid so that I'm good to go for the next step. Now you must understand that there's always a major conflict between the sharp powered reamer and the retractors here. So this is the wire retractor, sorry. Let me go back there, okay. So this is the wire retractor that goes in gently underneath at six o'clock. Sometimes I add that on the posterior side as well because of the curvature, it allows the reamer to come in. It's not unusual to have the reamer conflict with the retractor. And in that case, it is dangerous because it can fracture the glenoid. Uh, one doesn't understand the power of these reamers. So sometimes you have to be very careful and ensure that it's freely rotating and it's not catching on any of the reamers. That can be dangerous because you're dealing with some very fragile bones, very osteoporotic ladies in these cases. So as long as you have a free run, and then you have to do only a gentle reaming. I don't do an extensive reaming like the acetabulum. It's barely just a dusting of the glenoid. But here's my take. On those frail old grannies, I avoid the reamer and I use a curate because I'm just doing this uh, safely, but you need to do it in a uniform manner. I picked this idea from Mike Robloski from Wrightington when I trained under him for hip arthroplasty. And I use this very regularly for those frail ladies who have a very poor quality bone. It's a safe technique to use rather than those powerful reamers when you suspect. So do you always need to do a trial reduction? I would say yes. So I have seen senior surgeons uh, getting embarrassed because they put in the process and they couldn't reduce it. So it's risky. But once you get experience, then you can put in a process directly. But uh, on the top video here, you see I'm struggling with that trial reduction. So it's too tight. And so I'm going to remove the proximal um, trial prosthesis and then go ahead and do some more uh, releases. So what kind of releases do I do? So you best to do a humeral release on the medial side and that's safer. If still that doesn't work, then go on the glenoid side at six o'clock, release some of the anterior inferior tissues between the five o'clock and six o'clock position. And if still tight, then you go back and then perform a humeral recut and that's about two to five mm, and that should be enough. You don't want to do too much. And it's always better to do a conservative humeral resection and then augment it with another five mm cut as such. What is important to recognize is the upper third rule that if your glenosphere is uh, very close to the tibial tray and your tibial tray is at the upper third of the glenosphere, then you know that this reduction is going to work. Then you need not do a trial reduction. If the humeral tray is too high up on the glenosphere, you should be careful that this is not working. Ensure that the anesthetist, the muscle relaxant has not worn off because I've been caught out a couple of times that way. To be honest, I'm going to speak for all of us here. This is the most fiddly, embarrassing step. It is uh, difficult. So you need to get used to the process. As your glenosphere goes in, do remove that wire retractor because that prevents the glenosphere from going into its home position. And then gently remove your uh, holder and then bring in the punch and knock in the glenosphere. Prosthesis of the glenosphere prosthesis who have a cannulated hole uh, will not accept the screw unless it is in its home position. So that's a good thing for those processes. But uh, this is a biomet comprehensive and it doesn't have a cannulated hole. So you don't want to fix it in eccentrically. So be sure that you have a good exposure. You've removed the wire retractor. And once it's home position, then you just need three knocks with the punch and then it'll go him here. It requires a little bit of practice. A good exposure will allow an easy insertion. Even in the most experienced hands, this can be a very fiddly step. It's difficult to grab hold of that smooth glenosphere. 
you must remember stiff shoulders, revision cases, malunited fractures, and certainly the persistent dislocations are very difficult cases and they are going to be challenging. So you need to spend time, larger incisions, good releases, patient, don't rush it in here. Cases like this, where there's a very medialized glenoid vault, old hemiarthroplasties um, are going to be difficult and they're going to be much more tighter. So don't take them lightly. Be sure you're downsizing your glenospheres and the humans. Now you could split the shoulder community into two groups, those who repair and those who don't repair. Um, there are several subscap agnostics who never ever repair the subscap. Again, I'm in equipoised and I decide on a case-to-case -case basis. If I can easily repair the subscap without tension, keeping the arm in 45 to 60 degrees external rotation, I would without hesitation repair the subscap. It's a good stabilizer there. But subscap, is important that it's a schizophrenic muscle and many surgeons believe that in abduction, the subscap can pull down uh, the head and prevent abduction. And that's the premise why many surgeons do not repair the subscap. This is a nice paper from Jason Clark, 2012, JCS, where they said it doesn't make a damn difference uh, because in their study, they had equal number of complications in their both groups. But if your deltoid is poor, if your if your medialized process this, I would recommend always repair the subscap. So finally, coming to a few complex cases, um, this is a young lady. You come to the end of your time. Can you wind up, please? I will wind up very quickly. So this is a 45-year-old lady, everything gone wrong, two surgeries by surgeon. We're compelled to do a reverse in a young lady, and you can see that uh, she's done reasonably well, but so. Uh, it's a shame that uh, we had to do a reverse shoulder for a 45 year old lady. Uh, this is another patient. This is a neglected posterior dislocation. Surgeon didn't pick it up. And this is what has happened. The clean head of humerus is behind the glenoid. And uh, this is his result. We've had to do again a 51 year old, but this is the lasting solution for him. Uh, but these are difficult cases. And because they're revisions, they're going to be uh, highly common. Finally, I just like to finish off with this, where when you're doing a revision for a hemiarthroplasty, it's very difficult. This process is not going to come up. You must know the Van Thiel osteotomy. And this was described very nicely by George at Falve. Keep the pec, minor, pec major island graft, which will provide blood supply to this uh, long linear osteotomized fragment. You don't want that to get infected or necrotic. So in conclusion, I would like to say your pre-op planning is most important. Um, you should have complete set of instruments. I think the Delta PEC is a go-to approach for all of you uh, when you're initiating into reverse. Uh, it's the complicated revision cases, fracture cases, which are risky. You need to be very careful on that exposure. I haven't discussed the subscap repair or notching for time issues, but results can be enduring. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ash. <coughs> we now have uh, a commentator uh, is Ahmed Fahad Asir. Yeah. Yes. Uh, lovely. Yes, uh, thank uh, you. I'm going to hand, hand over to you, Ahmed. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ashish, for your uh, presentation, nice presentation. Uh, actually, you are using the Mayu table all the time, and uh, uh, we uh, we use the uh, spider uh, in uh, in the cases. It will make your life easier, uh, even in the difficult cases. Uh, so you will be. Um, uh, I advise to use it sometime if it is available with you. The second thing, uh, most uh, one of the most important thing that uh, minimal uh, humeral cut, because a lot of pe people they are taking uh, too much uh, from the humeral cut and they will struggle later on and they will uh, put a lot of augment that's just to uh, balance the soft tissue and the uh, and the offset. Um, the third thing uh, that uh, uh, actually we, we are using nowadays the 3D printing uh, for uh, these. Uh, so we are print, uh, from we are taking this uh, picture from the CT and we are putting this uh, the fracture type and the glenoid. So we can just uh, check the direction and the length of the screw uh, preoperatively. And we can just use the, uh, we, we know when we expose there, we can find exactly the direction of the screw. 
of uh, all uh, all screw in the glenoid. Yeah, with this uh, 3D printing for uh, patient by patient. And uh, okay, uh, Dr. Ahmed Asu. Can we, can we, can yeah, we get check with Ash, Ashish? Ash, do you use any 3D printing at all in your practice? So, um, Angus, uh, like uh, the Scottish, we are a very price conscious country as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> seriously, uh, we have uh, only 20% of our patients are insurance. But if I'm dealing with a complex case, a revision case, then I would use 3D printing. We also use the HoloLens to you have 3D holographic imaging intra-op. But uh, for my standard uh, primary reverses, I don't use these. Ahmed, back to you. Have you uh, other points? Yeah. Uh, there, there is uh, regarding the withdrawal of the uh, muscle relaxant intraoperative because we are uh, uh, receiving the patient fully relaxed and we are putting this uh, instrument and uh, the implant. Then postoperatively, if we are missing, uh, we ha he has a very good uh, muscle relaxant. Postoperatively, you will find that the soft tissue will be tight and there is restriction of movement. So I am using some time that uh, I am telling the anesthetist to minimize the uh, muscle relaxant after I put my uh, uh, in the sizing. Uh, then I will proceed later on. And I find right. the difference. Yeah. Yes, Ahmed, I think that's a very good point. But you yeah. must be a lucky man because my anesthetist sits in the coffee room. And so <laughs> <laughs> my problem is that when we start off, the patient is much relaxed. It's only two or three cases that I noticed that as the patient had worn off the muscle relaxant, suddenly the trial was easy and then the final process was difficult. So if you re realize there's a mismatch between your trial reduction and your final mm -hmm. reduction, don't panic. It's probably because the muscle relaxant has worn off because some patients metabolize their muscle relaxant differently. So yeah. sometimes junior surgeons would panic as such. Uh -huh. okay. uh, Ahmed, uh, may I interrupt you in a minute? Yes. Uh, I think it's a very uh, important issue we should uh, uh, explain in this session. In a very tough uh, uh, shoulder case, complicated case, how can we expose a difficult glenoid? I probably, uh, John may have some uh, comments on that. How you deal with the difficult glenoid exposure? Any of your surgical tips? Yeah. I I think we'll have time for discussion. You know, I think for me, the key for glenoid exposure is actually on the humeral side. So for me, the four keys of glenoid exposure, aggressive head cut, osteophyte removal, deltoid mobilization, and inferior capsule release. So if I'm having a hard time seeing the glenoid, I typically go back to those four steps, and I think that can get you there. In ho, in ho. Another way to do that is to do a clavicular osteotomy approach. Oh, that's then, then then the the window window. I saved for Angus. Absolutely. Don't I be was afraid. trying to stay quiet. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, I, I developed a, the clavicular osteotomy approach way back in uh, the 1980s. And uh, it is a good approach for a very complicated situation, uh, but it's not necessary for standard surgery. Yeah, it's just still alive in Korea, if I can say. So we have some comment from Yap. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, in the in the approach, the deltoid split approach, I find it very helpful, not only to take off the inferior capsule under the glenoid, but also take off all the capsule from the humeral side. Then the capsule is just hanging like a hammock, and it makes it easier for a retractor to go underneath the glenoid. So on both sides do an uh, extensive capsule release from the, the bone. Oh, Dr. Yap, in that case, do you see any clinical difference between two approaches, deltopectral and deltoid split? Well, both are actually the same. If, if, if you do deltopectral approach, and I use mainly the deltopectral uh, approach for revision cases when failed fracture cases or failed hemis. So you have to go deltopectral. And that is normally very difficult. It's always stiff. There's a lot of uh, adhesions around the shoulder, but for the glenoid exposure and the humeral exposure to take off the capsule at both sides and even cut in the capsule in the length, taking care of the axillary nerve to 
and even excise the capsule completely inferiorly if needed. And that will give absolutely good release in these difficult cases. Yes, Ashish. You know, you know I think that was a very uh, important point that you made. Is there a difference between the deltoid split and the deltoid pectoral? In accomplished hands, uh, like the panel here, I don't think it's going to make a damn difference. But in the revisions that we have done, when we've noticed that a novice surgeon has operated, I think the common error with a split deltoid approach has been a tendency, if you do it in difficult patients, to keep the glenosphere superiorly inclined. And that has been the mode of failure. And on the deltopectoral side, because of inadequate exposure, uh, the glenosphere tends to be anti-verted. These are common errors uh, done by novice uh, surgeons. So we must work on that so that you, if you know and anticipate this, then you would correct these errors. Ash, uh, I just want you to educate some of the audience. We've got some registrars in the audience. Uh, they heard you refer to uh, the Playboy retractor. Uh, can you just describe why it's called the Playboy retractor? It's the two bunny ears, oh, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Angus, I'm I just hope you're not wearing you. the... <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I hope you're not wearing the kilt. <laughs> Very naughty. <laughs> yes, I thought I would grab some eyeballs there by saying the Playboy retractor, but I think it's my it's my best. It's a workhorse for exposing the glenoid. Yeah. Well, uh, the reason I raised it is I think it's a super instrument, and I think it makes life so much easier. Both being used inferiorly, in order to hold the hold the hard tissues and soft tissues down. But I saw you using it quite a lot posteriorly, yes. and it works very well in the yes. posterior position as well. So it's a it's a lovely instrument. And if I can go back to Ahmed, Ahmed, yes. the spider yes. is a great tool, but it yeah. was banned in our hospital because it was so heavy that mm -hmm. health and safety said it was unsafe to use it. Now it may be lighter now than it was when it was first developed, yeah. it is quite a heavy tool. Yeah, now Smith and Nephew, they have something with a battery. It's very nice. So it's I am using nice. this all, yeah. Okay. That's yeah. yeah. Uh, we have a few more minutes, but uh, we have a question from the participants regarding the patient-specific uh, uh, targeting device. I think John Spalding has some comment on that. What do you think? I think there is an opportunity. I think we've moved from plain x-rays to CTs, CTs now to 3D planning. And I have to tell you, I've become more and more pressed with the ability for guides in a reproducible manner to ensure that the glenoid position is accurate. I actually think the guides are very helpful in the planning on the glenoid side. I don't think they're as helpful to plan on the humeral side because of the issues related to soft tissue tension. But I think it has the opportunity to decrease the outliers particularly in folks that are lower volumes. I think, so, you know, it's interesting. I think Richard Page may have a comment on this because I saw some preliminary data from the Australian registry that showed that the rate of failure is lower with guides. Is that correct, Richard? Yeah, th thanks, John. Yes, the early, th that's the early evidence. We've, we've not done a um, sub-analysis of that yet, so it's, it's coming along. But we know that in the knee, for example, registry data has shown that as well. So it it sort of falls into line. It, it's again, it's as you suggested, it brings the outliers to the centre. Um, and whether it's the guide itself, John, or it's the planning process that goes with it, that's a bit hard to separate out at the moment. But it's it, it's all part of the whole package, obviously. Um, I, I, at, yeah, sorry. I, and I was just going to make a, a, another a quick comment, if I may. Um, there was a question earlier in the, fir the first talk just about the most common mode of failure of reverses and certainly our registry data and as our experience is it's instability particularly in the first three months and particularly in males so getting that right and all the factors around alignment and positioning right which is a, a segue johnny to your talk but I, I think that is really if we're going to be teaching sort of basic principles that's the where we really need to focus on there's a lot of interesting stuff happening out there with customization etc but getting it right the first time and positioning is crucial. That was all, thanks. If I can come back 
to Ash, uh, there are a couple of things, Ash. Firstly, you emphasize the importance of repositioning the tuberosities, even in a reverse shoulder. Now, I was delighted that you uh, made comment about that because I think it's actually very important. Um, I think there is a tendency for people to believe they can put in a reverse shoulder for a bad fracture case and assume it'll all go well if you don't worry about the bones. I think it's actually quite important to try to reconstruct the tuberosities. What is your view about that? Absolutely, um, you're mirroring my thoughts. And although we consider the reverse uh, to work in cuff deficient shoulders, that's not the case in trauma. So not only does healing the tuberosities add stability to the patient, but it provides external rotation, which is a very important part of restoration of function and a good tuberosity healing. In fact, published literature shows that the tuberosities are more likely to heal in a reverse rather than a hemiarthroplasty. And I have a question from Stuart Proper. May I ask, he says, how many assistants each of you get to have? And Richard Page would like to answer that, but Ash, I think you should answer first from India and then Richard from Australia. Right. As I said, uh, because you've, we are- You've got lots of people uh, in India. You can- Yes, actually. <laughs> so three for every spider. <laughs> <laughs> so we do have a lot of fellows as well and it's important to bring them in for every case so we usually have at least two assistants if not three uh, during surgeries because it's nice to be participative and part of them they keep picking my brains as well at the same time uh, so that's one of the reasons we don't use a spider here well, you're, you, you are lucky, and certainly in the UK, we started to have a big reduction in our assistance about seven or eight years ago, and it made quite a big difference yeah. to the difficulty of surgery. Yes. Richard. Yes. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Angus. Um, I, I do use a positioner, but I get two assistants. Um, and I have to say, I know some of our Scandinavian uh, colleagues don't have any. And I have to say, I, I admire that. They are obviously very dexterous because I would struggle. Yeah. I, I really yeah. need, you know, yeah. I think unless you use a ring retractor that holds all your retractors for you, um, you, you need hands on deck. And certainly I do. I'd have to think really hard not to have two assistants. So Richard, that's two oh. assistants plus three. A spider equals three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, some of us need all the help we can get, Ashish. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Ashish, uh, I've been asked by Sofan Warnasuda uh, whether you always use bone cement. Right. Um, I try my best not to use cement. Um, I I'm, I much prefer an uncemented processes, and uh, that works best. Saves me a lot of time. And the modern uncemented processes are very good, reliable. The only time I might need uh, cement, and I'm not against using cement, is in trauma and in revision cases. Fine. Ahmed, you've got the last, uh, the last speech. Have yeah. you anything you want uh, to say? Uh, still, uh, it's not uh, not clear. I have a lot of questions that uh, you are using the reverse shoulder in cases that you have rotator cuff arthropathy and the rotator cuff will be in the uh, GT. Why should you put the GT anatomically? Uh, in, uh, and why uh, the G I mean the GT will uh, will be one of the most common uh, cause of failure. Of the uh, of the I mean the GT non-union. Uh, okay. Although you are not not depending on the GT, you are de depending only on the deltoid. Okay, right. you're asking uh, about the greater tuberosity. I'm going yes. to hold that for the discussion later on because it's it's not a straightforward answer. Hmm. So yeah. if we can save it up and we'll move on, I'm going to hand over. Uh, after I've thanked Ash, Ash, that was a lovely presentation. And the pictures that you brought us from the operating theatre were really appreciated. Yes. Thanks very much indeed. Over to Thank Inho. you.
thank you. Thank you, Angus. Thank you, Ashish. Uh, thank now you. we have our star speaker today. Uh, now I'm happy to introduce uh, John Sperling and special commentator Richard Page from Australia, and they will update us about implant design, current trend, and techno in reverse shoulder osteoplasty. John, please. Perfect. Well, thank you so much again for the opportunity to uh, participate today. And what we're going to be talking about today is some of the new technology that we're having in shoulder arthroplasty. I really enjoyed the talk so far. Very interesting hearing about the difference of opinion. And I'll share some of those differences of opinion with you as well today. So my disclosure, and we know that in reverse shoulder arthroplasty, it's essential to avoid superior tilt to avoid component loosening as well as notching. The other aspect we've learned, it's important not only to be able to have that avoidance of superior tilt, but inferior placement is very important. If you place the base plate too high, you also place yourself at increased risk for component failure. And I think one of the things we've learned now is, is that when, when we do an anatomic total shoulder, the glenoid occupies the entire glenoid. But when we do a reverse shoulder, the lower part of the glenoid is where we place the component to prevent impingement. And I think we need to think about the inclination separately. And this is the paper by Pascal Boileau in April 2019 that I think really helps change our thinking on this. So we know from the central part of the glenoid, there's 10 degrees of superior tilt. But when you actually go to the bottom part of the glenoid where we place the base plate, 20 degrees of superior inclination. And as Professor O noted, we have to correct this in all our reverse cases. So even in the absence of glenoid wear, correction of the RSA angle, 20 degrees is required to create a neutral base plate position. And many of us prefer five to 10 degrees of inferior tilt. Now you're talking 25 to 30 degrees of correction, which is a lot of correction we have to do on our reverses. And essentially what it comes down to is there's really only three ways to correct this RSA angle. You can eccentrically ream the central and inferior glenoid, which we'll talk about removes quite a bit of bone. You can bone graft that. And as we're starting to see in the literature now, the rates of bone graft failure with reverse are starting to become recognized. And the other option is an augmented base plate. So what are the problems with eccentric reaming? Well, I think what we've learned is, is that we remove a large volume of native bone. And unfortunately, we remove the best quality bone. So in a fracture circumstance, we tend to remove that hard cortical bone and an elderly patient, what we're left is with soft cancellous bone. And then we medialize the base plate, which has a number of negative aspects as we've heard a little bit about with a negative impact on the soft tissue, shorter screw fixation. And again, as Professor O noted, increased risk of impingement. So eccentric reaming can be problematic and this is an interesting study. It's an old study, but really shows that if you do one millimeter more of incremental reaming, you have a 43% decrease in contact of the base plate with cortical bone. So the glenoid bone is very precious and the cortical bone is very precious. And we need to be able to preserve that. How about bio RSA? This is interesting. I think some of the challenges with this, it can be complex. You can crush the bone during the procedure, fragmentation, as well as non-union. And it can be technically challenging. If you place a graft that's slightly too prominent, the base plate will not seat on native bone. And if the graft is too thin, you get no contact with the underlying base plate. And this is an interesting study. This was done by Brad Edwards, who spent a year trained with Pascal Boileau and on the bio-RSA technique. This was presented at the Academy, prospective study of bio-RSA versus standard RSA. I think the things that you see with this that are starting to be recognized is high rates of notching, 78, 70%. And BioRSA did not help when it came to notching. But I think this is the other thing. In Brad's hands, an expert surgeon, over one third of the cases had some graft resorption. And there's two very interesting papers that have come out. So the Rothman Institute in Philadelphia with Jerry Williams, Joe Abood, very experienced surgeons, on a primary reverse with bone graft, 25% failure rate. And we have a paper from the Mayo Clinic looking at bone grafting with revisions, 25% failure rate with a variety of implants and a variety of surgeons. So I think our hip and knee colleagues would say, 
We figured this out years ago. Bone graft is not a great idea. You should think about metal. So how much bone can you preserve with metal compared to eccentric reaming? And this was a study done by Tom DeQuinn, one of my former fellows. And the bottom line is you can save over 50% glenoid bones. So you can see on the left how much bone you remove with reaming and how an augmented base plate allows you to preserve bone and the best quality bone. So again, 40 to 50% bone savings and preserving the best quality bone with less impingement. So a number of us now use an augmented base plate to create the tilt and all are reversing and then adjust the tension on the humeral side as Professor O showed with offset trays. So the benefits of metal, it's simple, reproducible and time efficient method to provide lateralization. So here's a technique, massive rotator cuff tear in this patient. What we can see, no arthritis. We ream the bottom part of the glenoid to 50%. And then what we'll do is we'll place the augmented base plate in there. We'll prepare it and place it in the same rotation. And then we'll be able to go ahead and fix it down. And you can see on the intraoperative view how we've created the, the tilt with the base plate. And then we'll dial the glenosphere down a minimal amount. I think we used to dial glenospheres down excessively. I've learned this lesson now. I only want the glenosphere just one or two to three millimeters below the bottom part of the glenoid. And here are some examples here. This is a very small woman, how we used an offset tray and an augmented base plate. And as Professor O mentioned it's, mentioned, it's interesting, the offset trays slightly medialize the humerus, so you get less impingement, plus also you can resect less humeral bone. This is an example of getting less impingement as you can see. So a number of us, including myself, I use the augmented base plate on all my reverses. I've also gone to bigger glenospheres than many men, and I minimally dial the glenosphere down below the bottom part of the glenoid. And that offset tray, again, can help in terms of minimizing how much bone you have to resect. We can also talk perhaps, and I think Richard may have some comments on advanced polyethylene. So again, example of a small woman with an offset tray, and what I thought I would show now is a case of mine of a standard reverse arthroplasty of the shoulders. This is a patient with rotator cuff arthropathy we can see here. We get a CT scan on all the patients to be able to plan the case. You can see this patient has some superior glenoid erosion. And what we'll do is we'll go ahead and plan the case. So we can see, we'll put this in there. This patient has six degrees of superior tilt. And what we'll do now is to try to understand where should we place the base plate and what type of base plate should we place. So this is a standard base plate, a mini base plate. You can see the amount of eccentric reaming we're gonna do in the central and inferior part of the glenoid to be able to go ahead and get our contact. And then I think as I've learned from, again, my good friend, Tom DeQuinn, through some of this research, what we'll do now is we'll start using augments to see if we can preserve more bone and preserve more lateralization rather than reaming away that bone. So what we'll do now is to go ahead and switch from the mini. We'll look at a small augment and you can see now we get some improved lateralization. And then what we'll do in this patient, we'll use a medium augment and this will be able to get improved contact and improved lateralization. The other thing we'll do is to think about the glenosphere position. Again, I'll minimally dial the glenosphere down in these patients. A hot topic in the US now also is quality of planning ensuring that the plan we come up with is what we actually want. So this is an example of the intraoperative guide. And what we'll do now is with this guide, we'll have depth control. So I can preoperative plan exactly how much bone I want to remove and how deep. And there's going to be a guide we'll place on the reamer. This is all planned out ahead of time. Delta pectoral approach, typically about a 12 centimeter incision right on the front of the shoulder. I like to go all the way up to the clavicle, just lateral to the coracoid. And there's always a a triangle of fat proximally. I learned this from my mentor, Bob Cofield, go north to find the delta pectoral interval, one centimeter medial to the coracoid. We've learned we do not need to force in a tight stem. So we'll go ahead and make a generous entry hole. We'll place an ice pick in there to feel the center of the canal. And again, I'm not gonna force in a tight stem. We've gone to shorter and shorter stems. I'm a simple person, hemi total reverse, cut it in 30 degrees of retroversion, as you can see here. We'll finish off our cut. We'll put a brooch in there, and I like to release the capsule off the posterior aspect of the humerus. On the glenoid side, I like to sit the patient straight up and down. Try this trick. It'll really help you with glenoid exposure. There's different glenoid retractors. I like to use a retractor that has a hole in it. On the left, that's that glenoid access retractor. 
The center is the Fukuda, but the glenoid access retractor is my workhorse. So what we'll do now is we'll remove the labrum circumferentially, as you can see in this case, we'll place a Batman retractor in the front. We wanna see the entire glenoid surface, and then we'll place the guide on there. So the first pin will be able to go ahead and that's where we're gonna place our implant. The second one is more superior and that's gonna assist me with depth control. So we know we're down there and now we're gonna ream the glenoid. We want to ream a minimal amount of the glenoid bone away. And then we've already planned this case to be able to use a medium augment. So we have a little bit of bleeding bone in there on the bottom. We've preserved that nice hard cortical bone. We use a circular augment so I can dial in any orientation that I want. I've already planned the orientation. This is another interesting step where we can go ahead and prepare it in place in the same rotation. Another paper has come out and shown that if you have five degrees of malrotation of an augment, you lose over 50% contact. So we wanna make sure we prepare it and place it in the precise way. So we'll go ahead and place a guide on the bone. Once that guide is flush with the bone, we'll stop turning the screwdriver or flush like that. We'll put a black cap on there and then we'll be able to go ahead and ream the glenoid. I love that bent home and above. I learned that during one of my traveling fellowships that can really help give you a nice view of the superior part of the glenoid. And you'll see we'll preserve that hard cortical bone on the upper part of the glenoid itself. And there's the augment. We'll go ahead and pound this in, and then we'll be able to go ahead and fix it down. And you'll see the compression we get. Some of us like a center screw and you'll see the compression you get with that compared to a post. And then for me, I just put in four locking screws peripherally around there. So again, a simple technique. Once you see the whole scapula moving together with the base plate, you know you have absolute fixation in this case. And then we'll fill these in with the locking screws. And I like in a bigger patient to go to a 40 glenosphere. This is a smaller patient, 36 glenosphere. We'll dial it a few millimeters below the bottom part of the glenoid. And then we'll adjust that retractor the way we would like to improve our access to get the glenosphere down. This is the offset trays as Professor O showed. So this is a standard tray. You can see there how we have humerus above the offset tray. This is a plus three offset. And then we'll go to a plus six offset because usually the circle on the brooch there is on the inferior part of the humerus when we do reverse arthroplasty so we get better coverage. And how about intraoperative motion? So this is a standard tray. And what you'll see is when we reduce it, we'll raise the arm up in the air and you'll get some impingement. We get about 110 degrees of elevation that way. And then what we'll do is we'll switch to a plus three offset tray and you'll see improved overhead elevation. I really like the study again, Professor O did looking at this issue and how offset trays can improve it. So we get improved overhead elevation now with a plus three offset tray. And then the one I most commonly use now is this plus six offset tray. And what you'll see is better overhead elevation, looser joints, so we're not putting these in too tight. I think this is really helpful, particularly in smaller patients and it avoids you overstuffing the shoulder, which we really need to avoid. So we'll be able to go ahead and snap that together. I use a little short stem, as you can see there. A number of us have gone to using E1 polyon reverses because we think that wear is going to be the limiting factor in reverse arthroplasty in many of these patients. We'll tap that down. You'll see the circle on the brooch is on the inferior part of the humerus, and that offset tray then covers the humerus the way we would want. And then there's the motion we're able to get with that patient. Nice rolling motion, a nice overhead motion for this patient. So that's just the typical reverse that we do now with the patient-specific instrument. And there's the post-op x-ray, the offset tray, and the augmented base plate. So I think for me in my practice now, I think recognition of the RSA angle is key to preserve glenoid bone. I will tell you advanced preoperative imaging planning has really improved our ability to plan and execute it. But a hot topic also we might be able to discuss is that preoperative planning software is all or not the same. And I think accuracy of them is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. At first, we were just happy to have the planning software. Now we're realizing accuracy is critical. And I'd like to thank the meeting organizers so much for the opportunity to participate today. Thank you very much. That's great. You know, you're still on mute there, but that that was um, uh, terrific, John. As always, I, I always learn a lot from hearing you talk. So thank you very much for that. Thank there, you. There's a there's a there's a couple of questions, um, but uh, I might just jump uh, straight into just asking about planning, uh, which you finished off on. Um, 
Are there particular problems that you see with the planning software? Do you, do you use it always? And uh, as a flow on from that, um, do you, uh, you know, do you always use um, the jigs now, the printed guides, or do you see there's some cases where there's some limitations to that? So it's a bit of a two part question. Yeah, it's interesting, Richard. So at first, uh, people were happy to plan. So there are some systems out there that are auto segmentation only. Yeah. So yeah. you put in the CT scan, you get it back. But the problem they've recognized now, 50% of those plans are wrong because they're unable to separate the osteophytes on the humerus yeah. from yeah. the glenoid. There's one of our colleagues and friends who unfortunately has a video out there and he's talking about planning a case. He continues to refer to the osteophyte on the glenoid, but it's actually an osteophyte from the humeral head. So there was a paper published in Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery this year I'd encourage you to read that talks about the issue of auto segmentation alone. So for me, I think a number of them have gone to auto segmentation plus an engineer checking the quality of it with manual segmentation. So I think the combination of both now is important. You know, Richard, I think it, to be cognizant of cost issues, I think for me, I've gone to using it on more and more cases, but I think it's probably most beneficial to the really complex cases, glenoid dysplasia, cases such as that. So with limited resources available, I would use a guide for that. The planning software is free for most companies. I like to use more and more guides, but I think it's helpful for the complex cases. And again, Richard, I saw your data from the Australian registry. The preliminary data is interesting about how guides help. Yeah, no, look, it, it, it is. And, um, you know, we need, follow, we need, like all data, you need follow up. And we're, we're waiting for that before we do too much, uh, uh, do any sub analysis on it. Going back again, just as a background question, CT scanning, is that your routine now for all? Um, shoulder arthroplasty, shoulder replacement surgery? You know, it, I, I think it's been uh, enormously beneficial. I actually started the day I started practice 21 years ago, getting a CT scan in everyone. And I have gotten to the point now where I almost ignore the intraoperative appearance of the glenoid and I only trust the CT. I think we find that all of us have had that funny experience in the OR where some days the glenoid is facing like this towards you with the scapula. Some days it's like that, and some yeah, days yeah, it's like yeah. that, based on the kyphosis of the patient. So I tend to trust the CT scan on one side, and I have plain x-rays on the other, and that's what I use. So for yeah. me, it's become the standard. How about in Australia, Richard, for you and your practice and your colleagues? Well, certainly I, I can speak to, again, we do have national data on this, and um, in total shoulder replacement surgery, 67% now of um, uh, cases get advanced imaging. Now, Interestingly, that is predominantly CT scanning in you know, probably 80 or 90% of cases, but some of our colleagues are actually using MRI. And we know with, um, the, although it's not validated in the same way, but with MRI, we, you can get um, very good recognition of the bony landmarks, but not so good in the more complex um, deformed shoulder. So, um, but certainly CT scanning, and that, I totally agree with you. That, that is my go-to for every case, but it's interesting sometimes I like your comment about the plain x-rays. Don't throw them out because it, sometimes you want that global overview and I like to have that sitting there on the side. So it's not one or other for me. It's, it's one and the other, both. That's just mm -hmm. my, that's my practice experience. Um, sorry, Inho, did you have a, a follow-up question from before? Because we, we yeah, lost you a little uh, bit early. Thanks, Richard. Uh, we have a couple of questions from the audience. One is, uh, John, do you have any concern on the bigger metal augment i mean the question is if you use a large metal augmentation would that matter in the long term in terms of loosening or stress shielding something yeah and it, it's it is it's interesting i was at a meeting in brazil with pascal and we both came to the same conclusion from different sides he used bio rsa at an angle to be able to preserve glenoid bone we came from the augment side so we each came from different sides we both realized that the key on the glenoid side is to preserve the bone and also to be able to go ahead and get some lateralization. I think what I've learned over time, if you're going to do that, which I like, that you don't want to then over, over lateralize. So I don't use plus three or plus six glenospheres. I never use those glenospheres on primary cases and I dial the glenosphere down a minimal amount. So I'm not, I don't try to over force it on the glenoid side. And on the humeral side, I think having the, the offset trays allows me to cut less humeral bone. I think we've learned the lesson of our hip and knee colleagues. So they told us for years, you know, why are you using bone graft? A number of us have moved away from bone graft on the humeral side, haven't seen resorption. 
And I think the challenge now is on the glenoid side, I agree that bone graft is less expensive. Technically preparing it is more difficult. And what's concerning are the late failures we're seeing. And it's not just one surgeon. So when Brad Edwards has a problem, when Jerry Williams has a problem, when Sanchez Sotelo has a problem, when Sperling has a problem, when Steinman has a problem, it's not just one person that's having a problem with bone graft on glenoids. You're seeing it more and more surgeons now. So I think the tide is shifting away from bone graft in the shoulder. And I think our hip or knee colleagues are going to tell us, we told you this 10 years ago. Thank you. Uh, one more question from uh, Dr. Stuart Proper. If you are using a 44 millimeter glenosphere, do you place the base plate any higher than a smaller glenosphere? It's a technical question. Yeah, it's a great technical question. So what I do is I use, a, the base plate I use is 25 and in a small woman, I use a 36 glenosphere and I use a 40 in many men. But it's a, such a good question. And I learned this one day because we have a lot of surgeons at the Mayo Clinic, as you know, uh, that like to do total elbow arthroplasty. So one of my colleagues cemented the humerus in the total elbow all the way up the humeral shaft, right? Below the head, right? So he sent that to me for an arthroplasty and a little rheumatoid, and that was a tight shoulder. And what I realized that day was in a really tight shoulder, you can actually take the glenosphere if it's eccentric and dial it up and still have a few millimeters of metal below the bottom part of the glenoid. So actually in a really tight shoulder in a complex case, there's nothing wrong with doing that. We realize to prevent notching, all we need is a few millimeters of the glenosphere below the bottom part. But yes, I don't, I don't overforce that in terms of lateralization and thickness. Okay, uh, our well, panelist, Asheshi, you have a question for John. Muted. Hi, John. Uh, good morning. Good to see uh, you. Good, good to see you. Good morning. Um, we've discussed this before as well, but uh, expanding on our discussion, um, I know your work on the plus 3mm offset has made things remarkably different, and we've been a big, uh, we've endorsed that regularly. I would like to know, in which cases would you still use the standard metal tray, not the medialized one, and in which cases would you use a plus 6 offset medial trim? Now, I tend to use in my patients, I use a lot of the plus six offset trays. I tend to use a number of them because I tend up front to make a pretty aggressive head cut. So actually before I scrub in the OR in a small woman, before I scrub in, I say, open up a 36 glenosphere, dial it to B, plus six offset tray. You open up a small augment, I'm gonna place it superiorly. So it's just the bread and butter for me. And I think in those cases it can help because I can resect less bone. You bring up a great point, and I've actually been thinking more and more about this. The cases that I don't use an offset tray are the revisions that have a history of instability. Because what I worry about in those is I don't want medialization. I really want lateralization. So those are the only cases now I think about a standard tray. Uh, how about for you, Ashish? would love to hear about your experience and thoughts on this. Yes, uh, I agree. Um, pretty much same. Uh, our Indian ladies, like the Koreans, are much smaller in size. So invariably, it's going to be a 36 glenosphere. I always, always put it to B so that we've just got enough uh, eccentricity on the glenoid. And our go-to uh, metal tray is plus three. And uh, if it's a very small lady, then I would use plus six. I've just stopped using the standard tray because it doesn't fit into our, you know, unless we have a large six foot, 120 kg hunk, then maybe yes. Okay, and John. And I think your point too, Ashish, is that I don't force the base plate on the very bottom part of the glenoid anymore. We used to do that. So I'll put it two, three millimeters yes. above it. The other benefit of doing that, of course, is it allows you to resect less humeral bone and you, and you won't have as much glenosphere below the bottom part. So I've done those things now as well. I know someone brought that up and I didn't answer it. Thank you. Thanks very Lovely. much for your insight. So now, Dr. So Yap, we have a hey, John. Yeah. John, thank you very much for your talk. I have a question. If you have a case with a severe B2 glenoid, um, what is your policy? Do you still use your standard metal wedged implant or you combine it with a bone graft or do you ream more or do you use a custom made uh, wedged implant? Have a posterior. Yeah, it's, it's, 
if you wish. Another great question. So if the rotator cuff is intact in the U.S., what I do now, 10 degrees of retroversion or less, I asymmetrically ream. 11 to 24 degrees, I use an augmented anatomic component. And 25 or more, I go to reverse. And the, the, the system I use, there's lots of different systems out there on the reverse size, has 10, 20, and 30 degree augments. So it's rare that I need to use additional bone graft uh, with it. But on occasion, I do. The, the interesting thing, too, is, is that the cases where I get a custom glenoid made are not that common, just a few a year. But it's probably now in the patient sent to me with a failed reverse. So if someone has a failed reverse with massive glenoid bone loss, that's where I think about it. And from a cost perspective, those are really expensive. In the United States, they're very expensive. So I use those selectively. But for me, just knowing what we've experienced, that for me is preferable than taking someone's iliac crest or using full craft. Okay. Uh, I, we have a, uh, okay. Can Go I ahead. just, yeah, sorry. You know, can I just follow up on that? Just going yeah. back to more a philosophical question, uh -huh. John, if I'm, I might, about what, what you aim to do on the, the glenoid side in, when there is bone loss. Are you aiming just to restore joint line, you know, to try and get back to the paleo joint line where you think that joint should have been? Or are you trying to add lateralization on the glenoid side? Yeah, I don't force a lot of lateralization, Richard. And, and I'll tell you the one thing that I've done, which is also controversial, I do like to get people back to neutral. I don't yeah, like to leave yeah. people in retroversion. I think you start chasing your tail. If I leave it retroverted, what do I do on the humeral side? Yeah. And I think the other thing I've learned, Richard, I think you brought up the CT scan question, which is a really good one. I think looking at the CT scans that yes, there is some artifact on the revisions is critical. Because sometimes we get focused on how am I going to get this cemented humeral component out? How am I going to deal with the glenoid? Yeah. But the key for me on the glenoid is how did that surgeon place the glenoid component? Is it retroverted? Is there bone there that I can key off of to get the glenoid back to neutral? And really understanding the CT and the revision setting for me has become more and more important. Yeah, okay. Just sorry, another question that I was going to ask earlier, uh, as Sheesh, but um, and a couple of others, but it's come up now. Increasingly common, the second side, the, the patient and their second reverse. We're starting to, certainly in Australia, you know, this is becoming by far and away the most common total shoulder we're doing. We have a great love affair with reverse shoulders here. Do you treat that second side in terms of the version offset any differently? Do you, do you try and... You know, you try and customize, in other words, looking at their range, particularly internal rotation, I'm thinking of. You know, it's interesting. I don't, and I will tell you that I'm still one of the advocates in the United States for whenever I can do an anatomic total shoulder, I will do it. So yep. if I have an 80-year-old woman who's got minimal glenoid wear and a good cuff, I'm doing an anatomic, even if I did a reverse on her other side, which I know is controversial. And I'm sure we would all agree a reverse is faster and easier to do. But I really do still try to do anatomics whenever I can. You always have that pressure. I think we all feel it. If you do a reverse on one side and they love it, you, you yeah. almost feel an obligation to do the yeah. second reverse. But uh, sometimes you have to resist the temptation. How about for you, Richard? Do you change the implant position? Um, I, I, I love I thank you. I thank you for taking that back to the um, anatomic or the conventional shoulder because I strongly agree with that. Don't throw that baby out. The bathwater is still warm on that, I think. Um, but I will try and dial it around the version if, it, if we have to go to a second reverse. But I'll look, but as with all things, take a history, examine the patient and look at what their rotation and what their functional range is. And if they've got no functional deficit, don't play with it. But if they do, try and it's often the bit of IR they're missing. And that's that. I'll just tweak that a little bit. That's all. So we well, got a question. Like to... one question from the uh, audience here. Uh, John, do you think this is very futuristic question? Do you think there will be a role for navigation assisted technique in the future for reverse? I think there's going to be a variety of different techniques out there to be able to improve our ability. It'll. I think it's still to be determined which one is going to be the most effective. I, I, I did get a good question from Professor O there about using E1 poly. And yeah. there's some data Quint Rockmore has nine times less wear. And there is increased cost. But I will tell you, if you ever have this problem, what I did at Mayo is I brought our head of material management in the OR with me one day. On a 65-year-old woman, I cheated. Her life expectancy is almost 90 years old. 
And I stopped at that point. I turned to him and I said, well, if this is your mother, which poly do you want me to use right now? And he said E1, and then we switched over. Yeah. So get them in the OR, it'll help. Nice work. I like that. All right. Thanks John, very much. I would, it's such I'd, exciting. I'd, okay. Angus. I'd like to come back to John. I, I mean, you're, John, you're my hero. Uh, the way that you stood up for anatomical shoulder replacement <laughs> cheered, me, cheered me up enormously. Uh, there seems to be an incredible drive in certain countries uh, for people to use reverse the majority of the time. Anatomical, if you put it in correctly and you rehab them well, they do very well and they last longer, we think. We haven't actually got all the data yet, but there's some evidence that supports that. And uh, I think that coming out publicly and explaining to this audience, the 350 of them, that uh, the experts are still favoring anatomical where possible. You've done everybody a good favor. Thank you. I, I would endorse that, Angus, it provided, and our data shows you use Crosslink Poly, and it will out, <laughs> it, it, it's lasting longer it's in the anatomics. Sure, and it's wisdom, yeah. So it was such an exciting session. I do appreciate John. I mean, it was excellent. Your uh, scope you. and perspective. Uh, I mean, sharing your experience. It was amazing and very, very instructive to us all. And now over to Angus. Thank you very much. Uh, it is my real pleasure to introduce Yap Willems. Uh, he calls himself Willem Jacob, but he's actually Yap and. Uh, he is one of my long time friends and colleagues. Um, my best shoulder friend was Steve Copeland who died six years ago, was a great technical surgeon. Yap from the Netherlands has a tremendous reputation as being a very good, well experienced shoulder surgeon. And we're delighted to have him join us he is uh, a leader of shoulder surgery in the Netherlands, uh, has been the chief of orthopedics uh, in the Ons Lief Vrugasius, Amsterdam. Well, uh, Jack, did I get that anything like right? That was correct. <laughs> Nearly okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for and a nice the <laughs> we'll come back to you. The discussant is going to be Erica Colleen, and I'll talk about Erica a little bit later on. Um, so over to you, Yap. We'd love to hear about your experience of reverse shoulder. Uh, I'm delighted to listen to you. Thank you very much, Angus. Thank you very much, Ted, for joining me. This, I'm very happy to <coughs> be again attending an APOA meeting. And uh, I thank Inho and Nobu for inviting me to this talk. Actually, uh, Inho and Nobu asked me to talk about failures. And, and luckily, failures is not that infrequent. But what is a failure? Normally, when we talk about failures, it, it's about uh, complications and revisions. But for me, a failure is when post-operatively the goal of a well-functioning shoulder without pain is not achieved. And luckily, most of them are treatable, but some of them are not. Like in this case where after a fracture case, all the tuberosities were lost, the poor constant score and a painful shoulder. And there's hardly a solution for that problem. Well, we will talk about the complications and that caused the failure, most of the failures. Or overall, the percentage is 15%. There's a wide range in the literature, but the mean is 50%, which is quite considerable. But what is a complication? Sumsign made a distinction between complications with worse clinical outcome or problems, no clinical consequences. But there is an overlap. Sometimes notching is not a problem at all, but sometimes it is a severe problem. So this distinction is not very uh, absolute. These are the most common complications. And I agree with what Richard said, and also in my experience, instability is the most important complication. But comp the other three are component loosening, perspective fractures and infection. And there are more, but these are the most important. And I will address in the coming minutes, these complications. 
Well, I think Mark Frankel in this, in this group made a very nice distinction between several sorts of complications. So you should be very careful examining your patients. What is the basic cause of the failure? Loss of comp and compression, loss of containment or impingement. History is extremely important. Is there a trauma? Did it happen without trauma? Physical examination, especially neurology is important. Standard x-rays in three directions, including the full humerus AP bilateral. And you should, and this is simple paperclip, you can do other devices, you need to have a proper impression what the length is compared to hopefully the normal other side. Otherwise, if you have no other contralateral normal shoulder, it is difficult to guess what the shortening or lengthening is. And the same for humeral medialization. You should measure and compare it with the normal shoulder, if there is a normal shoulder, which unluckily is not always the case. Well, the early positive dislocation happens quite often, and we can discuss later what all the reasons are, but you can treat it with an open or closed induction with six weeks in immobilization. That is, has a reasonable chance of success, but consider a proper post-operative analysis. You should make a CT scan, measure the glenoid version of humeral version. You can use X-rays, but for the glenoid version, I find the CT scan, it's suppression of metal, very helpful. A loss of compression, if you have undersized implants, I made a distinction between less or more than 50 millimeter. And of course that's relative, 50 millimeter in an Asian patient is different from a Dutch patient, which is normally which is actually belonging to the largest, uh, the highest population in the world. So that is relative, which you should consider at least an, 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 a measure. If there is less than 50 millimeter, millimeter humeral shortening, you can use either a thicker liner, you can use a metallic spacer, you can use a constraint insert, which will decrease the range of motion with at least making the shoulder more stable. You can use a larger glenosphere, which only helps some millimeters, and eccentric glenosphere as well. So these are the less important measures. Basically, you have to solve it at the humeral side. If there is less than 50 millimeter humeral medialization, then and there's instability, you can use a larger glenosphere or a lateralizing offset glenosphere. And there's now the near all companies, there's a wide range of glenosphere available, centered, eccentric, and all sort of offset. If there is a considerable humeral shortening, you have to, most of the case, you have to revise the humerus. You place it higher and with a longer stem, mostly. Generally, I use bone graft, not only to compensate for the bone loss, but also increase the delta wrapping. And you can use an autograft prosthetic composite, which is quite expensive. But that's especially for cases like in tumor cases. The use of inferior base plate or accent base plate is not very helpful in this case of humeral shortening. It is too little to add to the humeral length, actually. More than 50 millimeter humeral medialization, you normally see the loss of deltoid contour compared to the normal shoulder. Well, most of the cases you have to revise the glenoid prosthesis. You can try with larger glenohumosphere and test the shoulder, but normally it is not that stable and you need the bone graft. And we can discuss with John if the bone graft will help or you need a metallic implant, but I standard use a bone graft to increase the, the, dist the, the distance to the uh, center point. At the humeral side, you can change the direction and some of the devices made possible to change the position of the tray could get more medially and lateralize and, and that way the humeral implant and also lateralize the shoulder. The deltoid insufficiency, it has been discussed earlier. A non-functioning deltoid is mainly seen after revision procedures or in excessive lengthening, especially in, uh, when the deltoid is non-functioning, the axillary nerve is involved and in excessive lengthening, sometimes also the radial nerve and sometimes plex plexus pathology traction on the plexus plays a role in a non-functioning deltoid. Luckily, it is mostly neuroapraxia and it, and it recovers. But sometimes it is, especially in revision cases, the radial nerve is damaged. That is a serious problem. But we, we know from the, sorry, 
that the reverse uh, in a compromised deltoid is a big challenge. There is no literature that if you have a partial insufficiency, one third, and it's mostly the anterior part after previous procedures, or the two thirds when a trans deltoid uh, approach is used for a fracture case, it, it, the middle or the middle and anterior part are defect. But luckily, the reverse is still functioning in these cases. There are poor results with global insufficiency where the complete deltoid is gone. The clinical outcome is rather poor, although the, the instability is not always that uh, present. Coming back, sorry, uh, to the subscapularis insufficiency, there's an ongoing debate, debate, and we discussed it earlier. Should you repair or should you not repair? There are several studies that makes no difference if you have a subscap or not, or you have if in, in these series you have more instability. The problem with all these series is that there are a lot of confounders. Many of these uh, cases, there were revision cases and uh, that makes it not comparable with primary cases. So that is a little bit debate going on, should to repair. Loss of containment, oh, this is an example. It's right easy to solve, but this is a more Difficult to solve, you have to revise the humoral component. This is an old grammar prosthesis, and luckily the present prosthesis, especially the shorter stems, doesn't lead to this problem. But this association of the prosthesis components can, can play a role in instability. Another cause of containment, if you have severe notching, severe polyethylene wear, this was a case where there was severe notching, no instability due to the glenoid prosthesis, but instability due to the insert. You can replace the insert quite easily. And we all know that in the, especially the Grammont type of prosthesis, there is a severe wear of uh, polyethylene wear. And this computer model of Terrier showed a considerable wear compared to a total shoulder prosthesis. The third cause of instability, impingement. An ectopic bone, especially in post fracture cases, a malunited or ectopic bone or a malunited greater toporosity, like shown here, a malalignment of the prosthesis, too much retro or anteversion of the glenoid, giving an anterior or posterior impingement, which can lead to instability. And another quite important uh, uh, cause of impingement is the soft tissue, capsule, or tendon that remains in the shoulder and causing impingement, and the triceps origin. Um, triceps origin can sometimes be very, very well developed and causing an inferior impingement. And you should test, not only test anterior and posterior instability during the surgery, but also the inferior instability. Sometimes you have to, have to cut away the, uh, the triceps. And of course, you have to consider osteophytes inferiorly. Well, the fourth, of course, the most frequent, uh, the scapular notching, one, zero, one, and two, never hardly ever cause instability, but type three and type four can lead to severe notching like here, breakage of the screw, impending instability. And then there's another case where there is a dislocation due to breakout due to this very, very severe notching inferiorly. And that is I expect, that is an older Grammont type where we didn't pay attention that much on the inferior or eccentric placement. So generally you have to revise the uh, Glenoid with a bone graft or a base plate and a base plate with a longer peg. But presently, there's a lower incident of notching thanks to the lower neck shaft angle, the lateralization, and the inferior or eccentric glenosphere. And there's an interesting review overlooking more than 2,000 shoulders. Two parameters were compared the neck shaft angle and the notching. And there's more severe notching as you can expect in 155 degrees. But interestingly, they didn't see difference in the number of the degree of the dislocations. The third pathology, protective fracture on the humeral side. I like this classification of Kirchhoff and uh, uh, the three areas where the fractures occur. Well, in a stable fracture, you can use conservative treatment. This patient refused treatment and healed well with malunion. Normally I use ORF, either cyclage of plate and cyclage. In unstable loop places, you have to revise and here an example of the revision and the long term and the one year of 
follow up with a good result. The glenoid fracture always have to be revised one or two stages. An example, 65 year old, kidney insufficiency of knee arthrodesis after an infection total knee, and hemi for AVM of his human head, severe wear, put in the reverse with the bone graft, 16 months later fall, part of the bone graft was resorbed. I didn't dare to put in an, a one stage revision, so I put in this graft and put in hemi and maybe later on the reverse, but he was reasonably happy with this uh, function and uh, the prosthesis survived the patient. He died three years due to his comorbidities. So hemi can be a solution. The acromion spine fractures, not that very frequent. Osteoporosis is the main reason. <clears throat> it is more seen in inflammatory arthropathy and massive curve tears. The misplaced grooves going into the spine. Well, these are the position problems, excessive lowering of the humerus and two medial glenoid given severe vertical pull of the deltoid and two lateral glenoid can give stress on the acromion. So there are several reasons, but luckily not that frequent. And normally, now we use the Levy classification in one type of three here in the spine and here in the acromion. There's an ongoing debate on the treatment. Generally start with conservative treatment in painful non-union, go for, for surgery. And actually I operated only on painful non-unions of type two and type three. And clinical results are generally inferior, both after union or after non-union. So the last group, prosthetic joint infections. These are the standard diagnostics. ESR and CRP are not very reliable. Synovial uh, interleukin-6 is getting more reliable. Biopsy, not very reliable, both through aspiration or, or arthroscopy. Uh, you need x-rays at least in the CT scan and sometimes nuclear scintigraphy. And these are the organisms most frequently seen in shoulder reverse infections. And keep in mind, pain at rest is an infection until otherwise proven. And since this meeting we, we had in uh, 2018, um, into the, uh, uh, the meeting consensus on mesoskeletal infection, we have these definitions. A definite PGI is a sinus tract complicated with prosthesis, gross interarticular pus, two positive cultures with identical variant organisms. And probable PGI, the six positive mind effectors, and you can find this in this very interesting information on this website, um, uh, probable and positive organisms. A possible PGI, six of these factors and no organisms. In acute prosthetic joint infection, you can mainly come out with an DAI, or debridement antibiotics implant retention. In chronic cases, you have to do a revision one or two or even three stage revision. And in morbid patients who can't have surgery, you can consider suppressive antibiotic treatments, but the, it is not effective at the long run. So it is just a palliative treatment actually. Well, we know now also from these data we collected in the consensus meeting that the one stage uh, uh, revision shows a significant lower infection rate and a significantly lower complication rate versus two stage. Although we have no comparative studies at the present in the literature. If you do two stage, I prefer to use a spacer between the surgeries. <coughs> revision of the stem is not always that easy here. I was very lucky to extract it together with the cement mantle, but generally it is more difficult. These are my standard approach, preventive wires around the shaft, longitudinal osteotomy and cement. You can use remove the chisels or ultrasound, but you have to be very careful. I once damaged the radial nerves. The bone, the, the, the ultrasound is based on the fact that you hear a different sound between bone or cement, but in the uh, arthroplasty shoulder, the cortex is rather sometimes very thin and you can't hear the distinction between the sound of the cortex of the of the cement so be very careful in this uh, in using the ultrasound two cases to end up a male 75 years old four previous surgeries including hemiprosthesis he was referred because of the painful hemiarthroplasty it was revived to reverse and all the perioperative cultures were negative so uh, this is the situation after the insertion of prosthesis, eight months postoperatively, already impending loose lines, and here a complete loose prosthesis. He had a positive, uh, uh, positive culture. And he, we put in a, a spacer, 
and he hated the space and it was too painful. So we ended up with a flail shoulder and this was his function. And he was reasonably happy with this situation, at least no impending surgery anymore and the pain was bearable. So a flail shoulder can be an option, sorry. Case two, a 54, 45 year old lady, post instability, uh, osteoarthritis in the left shoulder. He inserted the total shoulder in 2003. And this was her X-ray and uh, her CT scan. The perioperative cultures were negative. One year postoperatively, mild painful, limited function and a constant score of 58. And here, and loosening of the glenoid already after one year. We did the revision of the glenoid, microscopically not infected, five cultures were negative, and we, re and, uh, we did a gram stain during the surgery, and we dared, because it didn't look infected, to put in a new glenoid prosthesis, as shown here. Two, four, two years later, there was a recurrence of pain, there were lucencies around the glenoid and the humor component. We removed the total shoulder and three out of five cultures were now positive for CNS. We did a two-stage revision, a spacer, eight weeks later, the reverse. Cultures were negative and uh, six weeks intravenous antibiotics, six, another six weeks oral antibiotics. Did well for one and a half year, the recurrence of pain, the aspiration showed the same CNS we did a one stage revision of both components. She did well for one year, recurrence of pain and loosening, loosening of the stems, we removed all the components and we sent her to another center for a second opinion while we considered an arthrosis, which was quite a yeah. heavy Can you decision. Wind up, please? Yes, we are nearly ready. So we did an arthrosis with a vascularized fibular graft. It took two more operations to get it completely healed. But finally, she was reasonably happy. The arm was a little bit shorter. It makes it a little bit more convenient for reaching her hand to the mouth. So that was an, bad, an end solution. But for that patient, that was the best solution at that moment. We have very few literature on revision of uh, re reverse arthroplasties. This two center story from France, 80 shoulders. Instability was the most prominent cause. Green node failure in 24%, infection 24%, the human impact losing 10%. So basically, instability is the number one. So complications are not rare. Most of them can be treated, luckily, and some end up with a flail shoulder or a spacer or in very severe cases, an arthrodesis. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, yeah. Lovely. Now, I'd like to go from an old star, with due respect yet, to a rising star who is the discussant uh, at this meeting. A lot of you will not know uh, Erica Colleen. I have had the honour of meeting her in Korea, and I can tell you she blew me away. Nothing to do with her appearance, but with her knowledge and her scientific background, she is going to be one of the leading upper limb academic surgeons in the world. And she's now going to challenge you, Yap, with questions related to your presentation. Erica. Thank you, Professor Angus, for a wonderful and uh, most delightful introduction for me. Um, Dr. Williams, your talk is magnificent, uh, but I have a few uh, comments on your talk, uh, which perhaps uh, uh, related to my background as the third generation of the shoulder surgeon, maybe. Um, I would like to make a comment on the PGI, the prosthetic joint infection. So case number one, uh, that guy has a flail shoulder at the end. And why you didn't do arthrodesis for the case number one? Can I know the reason? Yeah, the main reason that he had totally six shoulder surgery before 
and he was really fed up with any other surgery. So he, okay. I suggested him after removing the spacer to put in the reverse, but he refused. Okay. And that is sometimes the case in these, in these failures that patients had so many surgeries before. It starts with some fracture treatment, the redo for fracture treatment, and then a failed to remove the plate and do an adhesiolysis. And then the fourth is a reverse and the reverse gets infected and so on and so on and so on. So that is the case I, I sometimes see and they really are fed up with it. Okay, so... Uh, Erica, if, I, if I could come in here, doing yes, an arthrodesis in a case like this is really, really difficult because there is very little bone left to arthrodes. Uh, and therefore one alternative is to get a mold of the proximal humerus made and put that in as an interposition. Um, but it's a really difficult situation. Over back, back to you, uh, Erica. So a resection arthroplasty sometimes is the solution for a uh, the uh, for a severe shoulder joint problems. What do you think, Dr. Williams? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I always offer the patient an, 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 again a reverse, but sometimes a failed shoulder is acceptable. But generally, the clinical outcome is poor. But um, the pain is de depending, sometimes substantial, sometimes reasonable. So sometimes patients end up with a flail and, so, and they are happy. And sometimes they come back and say, please, can you do something? And then you can try another reverse arthroplasty. Okay, I'm asking this because a, a prosthesis, prosthesis is very expensive in our country. So yeah. we do have a money problem too. A second question uh, is a follow-up question for the case number two, which is very related to case number one. In the case number two, that, that was a lady uh, that really catch my eyes that I only saw a few arthrodesis case. And that case, uh, she had a multiple attempt of the Brightman and component revision. But the ending is arthrodesis and patient was, I think, happy. I begin to think that perhaps arthrodesis is not as bad as I think and could be a visible option for a complicated PGI. Because uh, I, I think I heard that an arthrodesis of the shoulder is actually a historical solution for the severe shoulder joint problems. Maybe it's not very historical. No. What do you think on this? Yeah, well, I think it, it, in, in the in a certain sense, aspect that is uh, historical. Um, when we didn't have a well-developed shoulder arthroplasty, we, shoulder arthrodesis was a very common procedure. But I think the only indication nowadays for a shoulder arthrodesis is a neurological problem. And there's a complete fleshed, flecked uh, shoulder due to involvement of all muscles around the shoulder. The shoulder arthrodesis is the, uh, the best solution. And uh, well, luckily, I had only two cases of uh, shoulder arthrodesis after the failed reverse. But indeed, as Angus said, it is a difficult procedure. After that, after my case of arthrodesis, I had to do two redo uh, operation to add more bone to get finally healing of the, uh, of the uh, defect. Erica, you know, can I interrupt you for a minute? Sure, Professor. I think uh, Yap gave us a very good insight on mm -hmm. prosthetic joint infection, but I would yeah. like to hear how John Sperling and Richard Page, they deal with this uh, prosthetic infection. Mm -hmm. Any of you attempt single stage revision surgery or do you prefer stage revision as always? Yes, yeah, so for me, for an acute infection in a well-functioning prosthesis, I'll consider a poly exchange and a debridement. Unfortunately, most of the people that are sent to me are chronic infections, and then I tend to do two stages. I'd love to hear what uh, Richard has to say and what the registry tells us. Um, so first of all, yes, an acute infection, but you want a, um, a favorable host and a favorable organism. So I, I, I would throw those caveats in. So in other words, a patient who um, it, it's, it's acute, you can do a poly exchange. You've got an organ first of all, you've got an organism isolated. And secondly, you've got a, a host who can stand up with the antibiotics and has got not too comorbid. I, um, otherwise, I, uh, I still um, err on the side of um, two-stage. Um, and often that first stage um, 
you're still you're actually waiting for um, extended cultures to get some of the difficult organisms we have to deal with around the shoulder, particularly C acnes, but there's a, all, a whole range of other things that can be difficult to, to culture, particularly when there's been multiple surgeries, there's been intermittent antibiotics, et cetera. So I think following the Oxford protocol, uh, which was, I think Yarp alluded to, which is in that P, P, uh, PJI link is very important to, um, and the sensitivity and specificity is very specifically five samples for that. Taking more is not, is actually decreases your, um, uh, the accuracy and the specificity of your cultures. Um, to, relation to the registry, John, the what I, what I can tell you is the results and the revision rate for revision for infection is over 30% and up to uh, over 50%. So if you revise somebody for infection, uh, the outcome is not good. But that's based on broad registry data. So what about your experience in Ashe in India, Ashish? You need to unmute. Ash, unmute, please. Um, I agree with Richard. Uh, the revision of a infected prosthesis single stage is uh, very likely for failure. Uh, succeeded in two out of 10 patients. Uh, but it can come back anytime. It could be three or five years later. So a two-stage uh, revision is preferred. The difference between one and two-stage is the function outcome after a one-stage revision is far superior than the function mm -hmm. outcome after a two-stage procedure. But the result of uh, control over the infection is far better in a two-stage. So it depends on how fulminant the organism is. What uh, intrigues me is that we don't see uh, any... Um, infection from PGI um, as commonly as seen in the West. Uh, most of our infections are staphylococcus, uh, if at all, and they're iatrogenic or coming from previous surgery. So k wire fixations, previous surgery are more likely to get infected than primary reverse shoulder replacements. And Professor, would you like to share your perspective? Yeah, uh, as John said, that in case of the acute infection, within one week, to, of the symptom developed, I like to use the one stage, poly change and massive debris. But uh, other than other than those kind of cases, I like to use probably I do only two stage revisions. Usually it take three to six months. I believe that um, laboratory exam and clinical symptom is much important than MRI. Usually MRI is high, really sensitive, so it looks still remaining uh, bone infection or fluid there, but there is it's just a reactive fluid or reactive change. So I don't believe the MRI, but believe the lab as well as the patient symptom. It takes three to six months after first surgery. That's my... So Angus, Richard, are they can I, can I ask Richard, oh, Sorry, can I ask Richard Page you referred, Richard, to a favorable organism. Can you define favorable organisms and separate them from unfavorable? Yeah, so, so um, fa favorable organisms are ones where there uh, is not a broad resistance group. And, you know, uh, and I guess what that's a segue into the fact that this is a multidisciplinary disease. So involving our ID physicians is crucial in this. And secondly, that there is a um, an oral step to equivalent sensitive antibiotic that you can actually take the uh, um, treatment from an intravenous to an oral uh, treatment tablet. Yeah, and it has to be you know treatment that is that is tolerated by the patient. So you know increasingly the resistant organisms, some of the uh, antibiotics are still active, but they the patients can't take them. So this is where you need again need the ID team. Uh, Yap, you've been frozen out by the discussions going on, and it's only <laughs> fair that we give you an opportunity yeah. to come back. <laughs> Have you anything to say uh, in relation to the discussion that's gone on yet? Yeah, well, uh, basically, my, my philosophy is that in cases where there is a clear infection, uh, as shown by aspiration or even radiography, I tend to do it one stage. But in cases when there have been infected 
Hamish before, and I did in reverse after proper culturing, and my reverse is uh, infected. So the more complicated cases, I tend to do it in the two stages. So that it's, but it is not, not, not very scientifically, but mainly on my, based on my experience. What, what, what can, will I can expect? I, but can for, I, for can sure, I, yeah? Sorry, can I ask you specifically in relation to acute infections, how much experience have you of using DARE and was it successful? Well, it, infection is very early, and the most case I've seen is when there, by coincidence, is a severe hematoma after the primary procedure, getting infected. They do very well with uh, DARE. Yeah. Uh, after, well, as soon as you see a component loosening, lucency lines, you know there is a bacterial intrusion into the humeral shaft. And that is a severe problem, which will never be helped with a dare. So the dare is for an acute infection, with uh, even with uh, a connection to the skin, and there is a sinus tract, but no loosening. Then I consider a dare. And we've got 340 people attending at the moment. We need to guide them. And one of the things that I made a big mistake on in my early career is I did not intervene early enough in some of my cases because you have to be convinced that you need to do something. What are the indicators, Yap, in your opinion, for going in early and washing out uh, and possibly exchanging components? Well, I think that makes definitely sense. If, the, if you have a suspicion of an infection which is not shown by whatever investigation. There's nothing wrong with going in and doing extensive rinsing, rinsing of the uh, cleaning of the, uh, and, 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 and exchange components. I normally exchange my liner. I remove my glenosphere. I rinse very thoroughly both. I put in some gentam gentamicin sponge between my base plate and my uh, glenosphere. <coughs> and I try, but well, it's more difficult to do it between the liner and the humeral yeah. stem. But uh, we are very aggressive, being very aggressive. That might be overdoing sometimes, but at least not under treatment, these cases. Thank you. And Erica, you have the last speech. Thank you, sir. I have one uh, very interesting question. Perhaps uh, you might want to jump in as well. So uh, during my fellowship with Professor John, he never let us touch the glenoid, uh, the deltoid. The deltoid he will do by himself in every rotator, open rotator cuff repair. That is how he appreciate the deltoid. So my question is, if you have an unstable RSA, uh, Dr. Williams, with a patient with a deficient deltoid, what do you do? Do you still proceed, or do you do another augmentation, or? Reconstruction. These are the same question from Turkey, Professor Karim Bilsel. You mean that when the deltoid is detached, you understand well, or? Yeah, it could be very thin. Yeah. It could be detached, unfortunately. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it has. If it has been detached previously, especially the anterior part in the uh, in the deltopectal approach. It is very difficult to reconstruct it. Um, sometimes you need some extra tissue. Sometimes in, in the, I use an allograft fascia to making it a little bit more robust and then fix it to the acromion and clavicle. And definitely immobilize for at least eight weeks to get a better yield. And even sometimes I use an abduction brace to get a release of the delta to get it healed. But it's a very challenging problem. Yeah. The same with the uh, transdeltoid. If you do an improper deltoid, uh, uh, transdeltoid approach, and you don't, uh, you have a detached anterior part of the deltoid, you have the same problem. To reattach it properly to the acromion is a challenge. So um, 
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to wind up now um, because this is the, uh, the time has run out for my session. I'm going to hand back now to Inho John and Ted Ma uh, to conclude the meeting. Thank you very much of all panelists. And it was an exciting meeting and I can't believe we spent two hours for this webinar. And our, our president, uh, Professor Ted Ma will uh, make a last closing comment. Thank you so much, everyone. I've been an exciting webinar and a great discussion and interaction. Thank you all. I uh, learned quite a fair uh, number of tricks and I hope you all too. I'd like to thank uh, all the speakers, commentators, moderators, and especially you, the audience, for participating. And I thank Stryker for being a sponsor. I'd like to thank uh, Auto TV and Hannah Balim committee members uh, and APO Secretariat uh, for the logistics and support for making this webinar possible. If you're not a member of this society, I really like to welcome you to join us as members. Uh, please send your inquiry to uh, us using the same uh, email address or APOA uh, online. In a few days time, uh, we will send you a quick survey for you to complete and return to us. Upon receiving the completed survey, we'll forward the certificate of attendance to you. Finally, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Kim Bun Sang, uh, Education Chair, to brief us about the next webinar uh, to be held on the 31st of July this year, which is also the uh, APOA Annual Congress. Uh, Mun Sang, would you like to uh, introduce the next webinar? Or Margaret uh, Falk, if you're there, Margaret. Okay. Uh, uh, Ted, uh, can I introduce our next webinar? Go ahead, Ting Ho. Okay, our next webinar is also a three uh, sessions shoulder for uh, SCR, which is a really hot topic these days, and elbow for osteochondritis, this second a common sports medicine issue, and we have an excellent guest speaker from Australia, uh, Professor Gregory uh, Bain. From uh, he is going to talk about QM back disease. So you will have all the details and the information in our web page. Thanks for that. And uh, to that end, I, that this is the post op webinar survey that we'll send you, but you can also log on yourself. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for attending, and I say good night to you now. Bye now for all. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks all. Good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye -bye.
How are you, Erica? Hi. Is this How's everything? Asur? Good? Yeah. <laughs> good. How is Long your time child? No yeah, me yeah. too. How is your I'm child? Oh, uh, he's doing fine. Ah, very good. Yeah, very Excellent. chatty. <laughs> ah, nice. Where are you now? In my hospital. This is my Where? meeting room. Where? Jakarta. Oh, really? Yeah. You, you finish your fellowship? Yeah, finally. <laughs> oh, finally. <laughs> it's a very, very long yeah. fellowship. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, with a lot of experience, yeah? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, alhamdulillah. Mm. Are you yeah. in your hometown now? Yes, I'm in Jeddah now. Wow. Yeah. Are very busy? Yeah, very busy center. Mm, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Which I will share is... you some of the uh, of the cases that uh, I did uh, in a couple of uh, weeks ago. Mm. Even two weeks ago, I had a very uh, difficult uh, reverse shoulder. <laughs> it was uh, neglected uh, uh, three months. Uh, glenoid with uh, proximal humerus uh, fracture dislocation. Three months. Okay. And oh. I will share it to you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's be- very uh, difficult case. I. I can't really do that. I just do a uh, simple rotator cuff now because I just uh-huh. come back. <laughs> no, no, I, I, it was amazing. Yes, even the, the result was very good. Wow. Yeah. You, you have a battery for the spider arm. That's very wonderful. That's the new yes, one. Battery. Yeah, yes, I, I heard battery. just now. <laughs> yeah, with a battery type. Uh, it's making our life easier. Mm, I think it's very light, right? It yeah. must be very expensive. <laughs> uh, actually, it's around uh, $20,000. Yeah. So finish this and... Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm so sorry. The, yeah, and then <laughs> we have to finish. <laughs> I will close yeah. first. Oh, okay, close. Then. Okay, okay. Because bye. Thank you. See you again. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank bye. You. bye. bye. Still, uh, post-webinar yes. survey, uh, Prof. After this, we will close first. Okay. Uh, two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Okay. Okay, bro. Okay, bro.